Hello everyone, this is Mohammed. I'm one of the senior lecturers in anatomy and today we had a session on the the bony uh, rib cage and the and the bones of the chest and the spine so I thought you know what might, might as well just record a little video on that. I'll be focusing primarily on the vertebral column and the and the ribs and the way they articulate with each other. Alright, so now and once again like not every detail is going to be covered in this video uh, you can use it as a, as a supplementary e-learning resource along with your PowerPoint slides and with your basic uh, lecture presentation uh, right let's talk a little bit about the vertebral column okay right so I'm actually holding a typical um, a vertebrae over here we'll talk about the different features of the vertebrae but before we do that, let's just talk about some theoretical points. So like we have a vertebral column, which is comprising of 33 vertebrae, right? We can divide these vertebrae into different groups. So we've got cervical vertebrae, we've got uh, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and then the coccygeal vertebrae. Now, what I'm holding over here is a thoracic vertebrae. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae and we've got seven cervical vertebrae in the neck region. We've got five lumbar vertebrae down below for weight bearing purposes primarily. And then we've got five sacral vertebrae which are kind of fused together to form one sacrum. And then we've got four coccygeal vertebrae. Right, so uh, I'm gonna use this thoracic vertebrae as a prototype to just uh, talk about different uh, parts of a vertebrae and then we'll actually see how do we, how do we practically uh, use different um, identification features to differentiate between the different vertebrae right so this is a thoracic vertebrae and like if you look at it uh, let's just orientate it first right so what we can see over here is a big body of the vertebrae that is going to be in the front so the frontal aspect of the vertebrae would be this one over here and this would be the posterior aspect which is uh, characterized by this spinous process which is pretty prominent in case of a thoracic vertebrae now this entire region over here at the back this is uh, the vertebral arch okay so basically like if you want to put it that in this way that the the, the vertebral body uh, plus the vertebral arch equals to the vertebra then that would be uh, true as well uh, so we've got uh, different parts uh, of the vertebrae forming the vertebral arch right so what we can see over here these little bony uh, pr processes popping out uh, from the from the posterolateral aspect of the body of the vertebrae these are known as the the pedicels. Uh, the pedicels they fuse with these angulated part of the vertebral arch over here which are known as the lamina, right? So basically the lamina at the back fuses with the pedicel in the front to, uh, to, to, to form something which is known as the transverse process. In other words, transverse process is actually present at the junction of the pedicel in the front and lamina at the back. At the, at the junction of the pedicel and lamina, superiorly, we can actually see the superior articular processes. There's one on either side. And inferiorly, at the same junction between pedicel and the lamina, we can see the inferior articular uh, process right over here. Right, so we've got, uh, we've got pedicel, we've got uh, lamina at the back, and the two fuse together uh, at this point where we've got a big transverse process popping out then we've got superior articular process at the junction of pedicel lamina and we've got inferior articular process at the junction of pedicel and the lamina then the two lamina basically fuse together with each other and at the junction at, at the fusion point over here this uh, process over here at the back this is known as the spinous process which is uh, going to be on the posterior side right so these are some of the features that you're going to be more or less present present in every uh, vertebrae right then what we can see over here there's a there's a big hole over here a space over here uh, enclosed by the body of the vertebrae in the front and by the vertebral arch laterally and posteriorly this is the vertebral uh, this is the vertebral canal which is going to be housing the spinal cord so the spinal cord and the meningeal coverings around the spinal cord uh, passing through the vertebral canal Right, so now what el what we can see over here is uh, a little foramen, which is 
known as the intervertebral foramen. So there's an intervertebral foramen, one on either side, and that is going to be bounded by the body of the vertebrae in the front. We can see the pedicel kind of forming the roof of it, and we can see the inferior articular process at the at the back. And then inferiorly, if I, uh, let's say, take another thoracic vertebrae and try to articulate that thoracic vertebrae, uh, with uh, the superior uh, thoracic vertebrae, then you can see uh, an intervertebral foramen forming over here, which is bounded by the 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 inferior and the superior articular processes at the back. Uh, it's bounded by the body of the vertebrae in the front, and you can see it's bounded by the that foramen is bounded by the pedicels at the top, and by the pedicels down below over here okay All right this is the intervertebral foramen and uh, the spinal cord we said is going to be running through the vertebral canal that spinal cord gives off 31 pairs of spinal nerves so there's one spinal nerve coming off uh, on either side both the right and the left side and those spinal nerves are going to be coming off uh, coming uh, are going to be exiting the vertebral canal through the intervertebral foramen Right, and that's kind of important to know because sometimes when with age we get uh, osteoarthritis, the little, the little osteophytic outgrowths which kind of form over here, they can basically compress upon the spinal nerves. They can occlude this uh, intervertebral foramen and uh, that uh, leads to, uh, that could potentially lead to uh, pain in the distribution of that spinal nerve. A common example could be sciatica, uh, although the reason for that could be, uh, uh, could be, could be herniation of the disc as well, which is, uh, which is another uh, uh, etiological uh, factor leading to compression of the spinal nerves popping out from over here. But anyways, that was just a, just a side note. So uh, we know about the different features of the of the vertebrae over here. Now we should be able to differentiate between the different vertebrae, right? For instance, like if I if I show you this vertebrae over here, okay, and compare it with this vertebrae here, then what do you think? Uh, which vertebrae are we looking at over here, right? See, this vertebrae here has a huge body to it, right? That huge body is a characteristic feature of a lumbar vertebrae uh, because the lumbar vertebrae are the weight-bearing vertebrae of our body. And uh, so they have to have a huge uh, body associated to them. Contrary to that, if you compare that with the thoracic vertebrae, the body is not going to be that large in size. Uh, and then what we can see over here, we, we, we can see the same basic features over here of a vertebrae. We can see the two pedicels popping out on either side from the from the posterolateral aspect of the body. And then we can see the lamina at the back over here. We've got a lamina over here. We've got a lamina here. The lamina fuse together at a point where we can see posterior spinous process. Although here the spinous process is not going to be that obliquely directed down where it's not really that long either uh, as we saw in case of a thoracic vertebrae or even in case of cervical vertebrae uh, and you can see it's quite thick and stout uh, little spinous process at the back uh, but the, the thickness and the stoutness uh, of the spinous process and um, the size of the vertebrae as a whole is basically a kind of a kind of directing you uh, kind of pointing you towards the lumbar vertebrae now we can see the the lamina at the back we can see the pedicel in the front the two fused together at this point where we can actually see the transverse process on the side and we can see the superior articular process at the top and inferior articular process down below now see if we compare the superior and the inferior articular processes in a lumbar vertebrae uh, versus uh, those inside a thoracic vertebrae we can see some differentiating features over here for instance you know we can see the articular facets on the on the articular process over here on the lumbar vertebrae we can see the articular facets are kind of directed inwards on the art superior articular processes Right. These uh, these are directed inwards, or they're in other words, they're directed medially. And uh, contrary to that, if we look down below here, we can see that the articular facets uh, in the inferior articular processes are directed outwards or laterally. They're directed outwards or laterally over here, right? Uh, 
on the on the contrary if we look at the thoracic vertebrae we can see that the articular facets are directed posteriorly in the superior articular processes and they are directed they are directed uh, anteriorly in case of the inferior articular processes and uh, this uh, basically this, this structural uh, feature basically translates into uh, the the, fle uh, the functional uh, uh, manifestation uh, in the vertebral column in terms of the flexibility of the vertebral column so like if you if you look over here the the articular faces are directed inward so this would actually prevent the lumbar vertebrae from moving uh, from moving side to side and this actually allows very little side to side movement in the lumbar region and it kind of makes sense as well because these, this is the area where the main weight bearing function of the body is performed we don't need too much flexibility over here but contrary to that in the thoracic region we can see the facets are directed uh, posteriorly so the inferior articular facets which are directed anteriorly they would articulate with the superior articular facets like this and there's a lot of side to side movement possible over here which allows uh, for the flexibility in the thoracic vertebral uh, column region right so this is these are some of the hallmark features of the lumbar vertebrae the large size of the body is the is the biggest hallmark feature and then you can see the direction of the articular facets are directed inwards or medially or outwards or laterally down below right now uh, if you look at the thoracic vertebrae we can see that there are some features which are like typical for the thoracic vertebrae not going to be present in any of the other vertebrae and those are these articular facets over here and an articular facet over here so you can actually see two articular facets on the sides of the body of the vertebrae these are the hemi facets uh, and we can see the same thing happening here on the other side as well we've got an inferior articular facet here and a hemi facet at the top over here why do we have these extra facets on the side of the body of vertebrae well it's because of the the, the articulation of the thoracic vertebrae with the ribs so each thoracic vertebrae is going to articulate with the rib uh, with, with the ribs at three different points we've got two hemifacets on the side of the vertebral body a superior facet and an inferior facet over here and we've got a facet over here this flat area over here on the transverse process uh, which also articulates with the rib with the tubercle of the rib over here and we're going to see we're going to see uh, in, in a few minutes as to how the ribs articulate with the thoracic vertebrae but these are the hallmark features of the thoracic vertebrae uh, one one thing you, which you can probably appreciate over here is the spinous process at the back and you can see the spinous process is kind of long and obliquely directed downwards this might be a good identification feature for the thoracic vertebrae especially if you're looking at the lower thoracic vertebrae because as we go higher up the the obliquity is going to reduce and it's going to be the process is going to be long it, it's going to be a long spinous process but it's going to be more horizontally uh, oriented and so you won't be able to really differentiate between the thoracic and cervical vertebrae based on that feature uh, which also have a which uh, the cervical vertebrae also have a spinous process but they are kind of uh, horizontally oriented so now let's uh, therefore jump over to a cervical vertebrae and let's see what uh, specific features can we actually see in a cervical vertebrae now if you look over here we're looking at a few cervical vertebrae over here right and you can probably what you can appreciate over here is that see i mean the basic features are pretty much the same we've got a body of the vertebrae in the front we've got a vertebral arch at the back i'm holding the cervical vertebrae through its spinous process this is the anterior side because the body is in the front the spinous process is going to be at the back now here something which we can see unique over here is that see inside the transverse process of the cervical vertebrae we can see a big hole over here right one on either side these are the foramina, and these are meant for the passage of the vertebral artery through them so that is something which is really unique to the cervical vertebrae remember in the last uh, osteology workshop we talked about uh, something which is known as the internal carotid artery which was passing through a carotid canal at the base of the skull that 
was going inside the cranial cavity to supply the brain. So the brain basically has two uh, sources of arterial supply, two main sources, an anterior one and a posterior one. Anterior one is through the internal carotid artery, which we talked about in the previous session, which passes through the carotid canal and then enters into the cranial cavity to supply the brain. The posterior circulation is via the vertebral artery, which is a branch of subclavian artery. Uh, and the vertebral artery passes through these uh, foramina inside the vertebra, inside the cervical vertebrae, to eventually reach up into the into the into the foramen through the foramen magnum into the cranial cavity and then supply the back of the brain. Uh, let's just put it this way for now. Although I'm just oversimplifying things because they're going to anastomose with each other and there is a lot of collateral circulation as well. Right, so anyways, so this is this foramen is a highlighting feature of the cervical vertebrae. Then if you look at the cervical vertebrae at the back, see the spinous processes are kind of bifid, right? This uh, this fork-like appearance or bifid appearance of the spinous process is once again a highlighting feature of the cervical vertebrae, right? Once again, we're looking at another cervical vertebrae. Uh, we can see the foramina inside the transverse process. Uh, we can see the foramen over here as well, through which the vertebral artery is going to pass through. And the spinous process, although shorter in length, that this might be a higher cervical vertebrae, but it still is bifid over here. Spinous process is bifid over here. Now, let's have a look at some of uh, the cervical vertebrae which are uh, which are a little bit different from a typical cervical vertebrae for instance if we look at this vertebrae over here see this is a cervical vertebrae as well However, there are certain differentiating features over here, which are, I mean, which kind of differentiate them from the other typical cervical vertebrae. For instance, like see at the back over here, it, it, it's got an anterior arch to it and a posterior arch to it. And at the posterior arch, we've got a posterior tubercle, but the spinous process is literally missing over here. Okay, right. And and then if you uh, if you look in the front over here. The, the vertebral body is kind of gone as well, right? Uh, this uh, might be a bit confusing, but if you look at the transverse processes here, see the transverse processes still have those foramina for the passage of vertebral artery. So based on this feature, we can't really miss a cervical vertebrae. Now this is the first cervical vertebrae, and that is known as the atlas. And we can see the superior articular facets uh, on the articular processes of the atlas vertebrae. They're directed upwards as if you're holding a cup. These articular facets are going to articulate with the base of the skull. So if you look at the base of the skull, we can see that we've got two occipital condyles over here. These occipital condyles are part of the occipital bone and they are going to articulate at the atlantoaxial joint. Right, so now if you look at if you look at the atlas over here, you can see that the body is kind of gone over here. This body, from an embryological perspective, this body is actually stolen by the C2 vertebrae, which is the axis vertebrae, right? And if you look over here, see the axis has a, has a body in the front over here, but that body has a little uh, bony process at its top, which is known as the dense or the odontoid process. This is actually the lost body of the atlas. And if I put the axis along with the atlas over here, this is how they are going to articulate with each other, right? So the axis is going to articulate with the atlas right over here, creating a bit of a, forming a synovial joint. And you can see uh, a pivot shape movement can actually happen over here. Uh, this is basically basically the no movement at the atlantoaxial joint. The yes movement uh, basically happens at the atlanto-occipital joint where the atlas articulates with the occipital condyle at the base of the skull. And so that movement basically happens between, between the C1 vertebrae and the, the base of the skull or the occipital condyles. Right, so now we kind of know how to differentiate between the different vertebrae. Uh, we can also uh, have a quick look at the sacrum. And if you look over here, this is one sacrum, which is actually a composite of five different uh, sacral vertebrae. 
these sacral vertebrae are fused together with each other to form what is known as the sacrum. Uh, then we've got four coccygeal vertebrae, uh, which kind of fuse together to form one coccyx as well. Right, now let's just talk a little bit about the ribs, right? So now let's have a look at this rib over here, for instance, right? Now we should be able to, whenever we look at any rib, we should be able to orientate the rib. That's our first task, which is to orientate the rib, right? So you have to know where is the superior border of the rib, where is the inferior border of the rib, uh, where is uh, the anterior and the posterior end of the rib, right? So if I just put this rib over here, right? And if you look over here at its superior inferior margins, you can probably appreciate there that there is a there is a long groove present along the length of the rib over here. This is known as the costal or the subcostal groove this groove always has to be on the inferior side right so this kind of tells me that you know the the rib is either going to be positioned like this so either it's going to be a right rib with the subcostal groove down below over here or it's going to be the left rib in that case the subcostal groove again is again is going to be down below over here now the question is that where is the anterior and where is the posterior end well, if you look at the ends of the ribs over here, see this is the anterior end which is going to articulate with the costal cartilage because the rib is going to articulate with the sternum directly or indirectly, in most of the cases directly or indirectly through the costal cartilage. This on the other hand is the posterior end of the rib and you can see that it is characterized by this bumpy head over here and if you look at the head closely you can see that there are two articular facets on the head a superior articular facet and an inferior articular facet right the head is then followed by this longer neck region and the neck is limited over here by this tubercle which is the tubercle of the rib and it has an articular facet on it as well so there's a facet on the tubercle right and there's a facet uh, on the head, a superior facet and an inferior facet. There are three facets on the rib. From the from the tubercle onwards, this is basically the shaft of the rib. And you can see the shaft of the rib is a little bit angulated over here, which basically allows the rib to move like kind of in a downward directed fashion. And this is important to know as well because because of this angulation, when we inspire, the rib moves uh, uh, a little bit in an anteroposterior, it expands the chest cavity. When the rib goes up, it expands the chest cavity in an anteroposterior axis, along the chest to expand in an anteroposterior axis. Uh, at the same time, because of the angulation, uh, when the rib bends laterally, it basically increases the side-to-side -side, uh, lateral dimension of the chest as well. So the chest is expanding in a expanding in a side-to-side -side, uh, plane as well, and then. Uh, because of the expansion of the diaphragm, because of the contraction of the diaphragm, the chest expands in a vert vertical dimension as well. Uh, this uh, anteroposterior movement of the rib and consequent anteroposterior expansion of the chest is known as the pump handle movement, and this uh, lateral or side to side expansion of the chest is known as the buckle, bucket handle movement of the rib. Right, so now we have orientated the rib, right? We know that this is a right rib. We know about its inferior margin, which is characterized by the subcostal groove. We know about its superior margin. We know about the posterior end, which is characterized by a head with a superior inferior articular facet. Then we've got a neck after that, and we've got a tubercle with a facet on top of that as well. The shaft is this region after the, after the tubercle, and the shaft is angulated at this point over here. Okay, right now, uh, just as a side note, the subcostal groove is really important from a clinical perspective as well because this is where the intercostal vessels, the artery vein, and the nerve are going to pass through. And this is important to know because when we do blind procedures such as such as a chest tube insertion, let's say to you know take out the the blood or pus from the pleural cavity, then we have to make sure that our needle and it's it's a blind procedure, right? So we have to make sure that the needle basically passes when it passes through the intercostal space it does not pass uh, near the lower border of the upper rib rather it passes close to the 
upper border of the lower rib in that way we're actually trying to make sure that we stay away away from the subcostal group minimizing the chances of damage to the intercostal vessels and the nerves so the structures inside the uh, subcostal group need to be protected right now uh, then the last question is that how does this rib articulate with a thoracic vertebrae right remember when we were talking about the thoracic vertebrae we said that we've got extra articular facets on the side of the body of the thoracic vertebrae and these are some of the hallmark features of the thoracic vertebrae then there was a uh, facet on the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae as well so each thoracic vertebrae articulates with the rib at three different points right now we've got also when we talked about the ribs we've got uh, we, we said that there's a vertical with the with the facet on it and we had a head of the rib with two articular facets a superior and inferior articular facet how do these articulate with each other well if if let's say hypothetically speaking this is the seventh thoracic vertebrae and hypothetically speaking speaking this is the seventh rib then how do these two structures articulate with each other well the seventh rib is going to articulate with the corresponding vertebrae which means the seventh thoracic vertebrae at the inferior articular facet on the head right the inferior articular facet on the head the inferior articular facet on the head articulates with the superior hemifacet on the side of the body right so if that happens right then you can see the inferior articular facet on the head articulating with the superior articular facet on the on the side of the body this allows the tubercle the facet on the tubercle to articulate with the facet on the transverse process right this basically leaves the inferior articular facet on the side of the body free now what's going to articulate over here the the vertebrae the the, the rib down below which means the which means the eighth rib that is going to articulate with the uh, with the articular facet on the side of the body down below over here so in other words what i'm trying to say is that the corresponding rib articulates with the vertebrae at the superior facet on the side of the body and the 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 the, the, the lower rib is the next corresponding lower rib is going to articulate with the vertebrae at the lower facet okay right another way of remembering this is that there are two facets on this on on the head of the rib a superior and an inferior facet the superior facet on the on the uh, the superior facet on the head is going to articulate with the inferior facet on the side of the body of the vertebrae okay and the inferior facet on the on the rib on the head of the rib is going to articulate with the superior articular facet on the side of the vertebrae of the corresponding vertebrae right so the seventh rib is going to articulate with the seventh uh, thoracic vertebrae at the superior hemifacet on the side of the body okay and then the transverse process is going to articulate with the with the tubercle of the rib all right hope this was beneficial uh see you next week in another osteology workshop thank you very much